The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. My job is scuba diving. I get to come out, I get to see great fish, I get to go, look what I did this week. <laughs> this was slated to become a 27-hole golf course, 240 houses, an airstrip. My hope is to retain as many representative blocks of native habitat as possible. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This is an artificial reef on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. Here the ocean will turn this rusty meadow into a booming ecosystem an empty sea bottom transformed into a dense underwater jungle of life. A few miles off the Texas Gulf Coast, a research expedition is about to begin. Brooks Shipley Lozano is chief scientist of the Artificial Reef Program for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Chris Ledford is the diving safety officer. I mean, it was so funny. They're part of a team spending the next four days on board the MV Fling, pursuing their life's mission and chasing their life's passion. The Gulf of Mexico has very few naturally occurring reefs. So artificial ones like oil platforms, reef balls, and decommissioned ships give barnacles, coral, and other invertebrate sea life the hard surfaces they need to survive. Energy then flows up the food chain, providing habitat and sustenance for snapper, grouper, and countless other species. Every so often, the underwater inhabitants here get visitors from up top. Marine biologists like Brooke and Chris, who have come to count fish, collect data, and evaluate the overall health of their man-made ecosystem. The monitoring program is essential to the entire artificial reef program because if we don't monitor the reef structures, then how will we know whether the fish are there, whether it's a good structure? Both Brooke and Chris help manage an artificial reef program that covers 4,000 acres across nearly 70 sites. I was 
introduced to scuba by my dad, who was a diver in the military. It's very much a part of who I am. I love just playing around down there, which is kind of hard to do when I'm on a work dive, but we always make some time for that. Sometimes it, uh, it is a lot of fun. You know, you, my job is scuba diving. I get to come out, I get to see great fish, I get to go home, you know, and take these pictures to my parents and, and my family and, and go, look what I did this week. <laughs> Barney, what's for dinner? I'm going to have hog gals, <laughs> cream corn, Boston grits. Boston grits. I have been on workshops where I have been gone for three to four weeks at a time. It's a wonderful thing, but it's also hard. You wake up at five in the morning, you don't go to bed until 10, 11 at night. But it is also so amazing because every day you wake up and you're standing in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> All you hear is the water sloshing against the sound of the boat. I mean, I, I sleep better on a boat than I sleep at home. It's crazy. What I'm working on is the database that contains all of the data that we have collected from 1993 through 2011. One of the things that I'm hoping to do eventually is be able to take all of that and run a spatial implication model using fuzzy logic, which is what my PhD was, to then determine if we're putting reefs too closely together. When you're a kid and people ask you, what do you want to do with your life? I wanted to be a ballerina or a veterinarian or a scuba diver. <laughs> And as it turns out, in the weird way that life works, I actually have a career where scuba diving is a large portion of it. So it's uncanny to me that at five or six or whatever age I was then, I actually knew what I was going to be now. I was probably primarily influenced with diving through two sources. My dad was a scuba diver. But also a big deal was the old Jacques Cousteau reruns. I always knew from the get-go that that's what I wanted to do. I used to actually get dressed up in my favorite scuba diving outfit, which was probably my pajamas and a pair of socks that were loosely pulled up around my feet, so they flapped around like flippers. And I'd slide around on my belly, pretending I was diving and being Jacques Cousteau's dive buddy. So it pretty much started at that point. And went downhill from there pretty much. When I'm at sea and once I'm in the water, it is just, it is the most serene and perfect place that you can be. You're there and you're weightless in this amazing, blue world where things swim within inches of your face and it's just, it's just perfection. Mm -hmm. 
I probably feel closer to you know the, the God and on all the spiritual aspects when I'm at sea in the water than I do even in a church. You know, it's just you and God's creations and, and perfection. Ready to go in? Let's do it. Matt Winkler is an explorer. There's a real excitement to trying to go in some place that you know that no one has ever been before. It's exciting to take my biology education and to be able to directly translate it into something that's helping people. How many different regions? At work, Matt work. is on the cutting edge of cancer research. During the week, I spend time at a molecular diagnostics company that I started. Off the job, he explores the natural wonders of the hill country. During the weekend, I like to be out of my range. So this is our bat cave. We have it fenced off to keep cattle out and a good sized colony. About 10 minutes after sunset, you can see clouds of bats coming out. We're here on the Pernalis River, central Texas hill country. I think the conservation on this ranch started when the Winklers fell in love with it. Things could have looked very different. Pernalis Falls State Park is right across the river. This was slated to become a 27 hole golf course, 240 houses, an airstrip. And so the neighbors and the Nature Conservancy were very eager to see that not happen and have this put under a conservation easement. My wife and I were looking for a place of 100 or 200 acres. One day I got a call from Jeff hey Francel Matt, Jeff. telling me about, about a fabulous place. Fabulous place. And uh, okay. it sounded just amazing. Great At ranch. the end of the conversation, I said, by the way, how big is it? There was a long pause. It's and then he said, 3,600 acres? No way. I told him, no way, just not interested. But he pleaded with me and said, just come look at it. And as we drove down the road alongside the Perdinalis River, my mind started to change. My wife's mind started to change. Long story short, some friends, the Reese's, bought half the ranch, and we bought the other half. He said his goal at this ranch was to increase biodiversity. Hard to argue with that. The Nature Conservancy has helped me out doing controlled burns. If there is a wildfire, it's not going to be as destructive. It'll stop uh, young cedars from getting established, and it goes ahead and kills non-natives. Uh, it comes back really nicely, thick grass, uh, blue bonnets. The diversity of wildflowers and other plants significantly increases after we've done a few burns. But it's really gratifying to see what the land looks like after it's been burned a couple times. Yeah, I believe I've got them all. Derek Burke is my ranch manager. He grew up in the place and knows it like the back of his hand. I've learned a lot from him, and he does a lot of the heavy work. The lands respond really nicely to cedar clearing. We're also selective about where we clear cedar. We'll leave strips in a dense cedar oak woodland provides shelter for deer, golden cheek warbler, a wide variety of wildlife. It was only after I bought this ranch that I started hunting and have really enjoyed it. And two of my sons are pretty serious hunters as well. Having rainy years, doing burns, controlling how much grazing you do, all of them contribute to what might be considered a more natural habitat. I'd like to think we take a holistic view of managing the ranch that might resemble how this land would have looked a couple hundred years ago. We're trying to make a habitat where deer, turkey, wildflowers, salamanders, where it's all flourishing. Near 34. The way he runs his companies, the way he manages this ranch, it all goes hand in hand. We're chartered to preserve and protect the natural resources of Texas. And I think that's exactly what Matt's been doing with this ranch.
we're going to move subadult female recalcated woodpecker to bachelor adult male sites. Sounds to me like you're nothing but a woodpecker pimp. <laughs> Is that about the size of it? <laughs> we, we think we're playing the mating game. I don't know if you want to call it a pimp. <laughs> I wouldn't put that on tape. <laughs> I grew up in Louisiana, and they lost almost all their native grasslands, and there's very little native habitat left. In Texas, you know, there's hope. There's still large enough space out here where we still have native grasslands in sizable amounts. My hope for the future is to retain as many representative blocks of native habitat as possible in this part of the state as well as the rest of the state. My name is Brent Artigo. I'm a wildlife diversity biologist. Our primary focus is for species of greater conservation need. Hey, Lynn. Hey, man, how's it going? Going good. Uh, what we have planned for today is a planned activity of going to the Parks Ranch to look at coastal prairie restoration. I'm Len Palashik, and I'm the Region 4 Wildlife Director out of Rockport. The coastal prairie, there's very little remaining in Texas. By coming in here and removing that brush, you restore it to a grassland community and you help birds like the bobwhite quail that are needing these big, wide open grassland spaces. Growing up, we used to always have this sound in the background of quail calling. But you'd be surprised how many places we go to today you don't hear quail yeah. anymore. Brent spends a considerable amount of time on properties like this where he can work with those landowners to help improve the habitat. I was fortunate to have a great opportunity to work with landowners to do real conservation on the ground and that's probably some of the best things I've done. Conservation for us, the only way we're going to accomplish it in Texas is to work with these private landowners and if they achieve their goals, they achieve our goals. Parks and wildlife biologists tend to be like a lone ranger. Uh, but in my career, I find that you get a lot more done with partners. We had this amazing team of people that came together trying to do conservation. We're all in there together. Everywhere I've been, I've had some accomplishments and enjoyed the process and really enjoy working with the people. Parks and Wildlife is a great agency to work for. I like to think of Lake Colorado City as an oasis in West Texas. There's just not a whole lot of bodies of water around here for people to enjoy. So we really are one of the main recreational draws around. Lake Colorado City State Park lies about halfway between Midland and Abilene. Built in 1949 to provide cooling water for a power plant, the lake offers a welcome contrast to the surrounding terrain. We're really kind of on the edge of the desert plains. This area at one time was a grassland prairie, but the mesquites and the prickly pear cactus have pretty much taken it over. With the dry that we have here and just a little bit of moisture, those type plants do well here. Are you ready? We're ready. ready. Don't lose your head. <laughs> Billy Wilson regularly makes the two-hour drive from his home to Colorado City to camp and spend time on the lake. We need to have some family time. Yep. And that's what I'm doing right now. On this trip, he's breaking in a brand new boat, and he's brought his granddaughter Lexi along for the ride. I really would like to see more kids out here that are my age. It's really, really fun. Lake Colorado City State Park has a lot to offer besides the water. 
Hiking trails provide a great view of the rocky shoreline. The campsites are wide open. Many cabins provide many of the comforts of home. The park is very kid-friendly, with plenty of space to ride bikes or just hang out. We got wildlife, we got birds. We get probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 species of birds. People love that. But the lake is the main draw here. It's what keeps families coming back time after time. You can look out from different camping sites and just see water. I like all the wildlife that's here. It's just really cool. People out here in a drier climate tend to enjoy the water because they don't have much of it. That's why we think of ourselves as an oasis, a place to come and enjoy the lake. The Texas horned lizard is a creature of contrast. Fierce in appearance, yet harmless to all but insects. The species may be threatened today, but in legend and lore, it has always been a survivor. Everyone is familiar with Tale of Old Rip. He's our most famous citizen. Uh, he's dead, but he's our most famous citizen still. Near Abilene, the town of Eastland is home to the best known horned lizard of all time. Old Rip. In 1897, they were getting ready to lay the cornerstone for a brand new courthouse. People were getting together, putting things in the cornerstone, newspapers, Bible, coins, different things. And Ernest Wood, he noticed his son playing with a horn toad. And he said, son, motion to him, bring that horn from. They sealed it up. Nobody thought much about it. Flash forward 31 years. I call it 31 years of peace and quiet. It's 1928. Eastland has boomed and plans a newer courthouse. By demolition day, the local newspaper speculates about the courthouse cornerstone's horned inhabitant. Every day, something about, is this horn toad gonna be alive? So, uh, had a good sized number of people here. Went in there and opened it up. Didn't look to be alive at all. And uh, while the man was holding it up, the other leg twitched, and somebody said, he's alive. The story of a horned lizard hibernating for 31 years captured more headlines. Well, they named him Rip, like Rip Van Winkle. Old Rip met the president and toured the country. His story inspired much debate and even a cartoon or two. It definitely was a Warner Brothers cartoon. And of course, the story was a little bit different. They had him actually performing in the circus and things like that. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my raccoon gal. I don't believe we got any credit on that at all. Baby, my heart's on fire. Old Rip wasn't a singing, dancing frog, but he was a celebrity. When he passed away, he was laid to rest in a tiny casket at the courthouse. And here he is, the world famous Old Rip. Yeah. It's amazing, uh, we've had people from everywhere wanting to see Old Rip. There's the horn frog. Wow. Just there, he sleeps all the time. 80 years later, visitors still stop to pay their respects, and locals still swear by the story. It's absolute biblical truth. Incredible, but true. The Old Rip tale may sound far-fetched to a biologist. But and it's a great legend which helped promote the Texas horn lizard.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.